In this lecture, we're going to talk about a different type of engine. Up until this point, we have looked at piston cylinder type arrangements, but not all engines work this way. And a really good example are jet engines. And as opposed to the auto cycle or the diesel cycle that we've talked about before, jet engines operate on the Brayton cycle. Now, here's a picture of a GE jet engine. And what I would like to do is encourage you to pause this video and click on the link in the description, which is actually this address on the bottom left hand of the screen, and just watch the video. It's about three minutes long. Now, what happens inside of a jet engine is that air is drawn in into the compressor section. And essentially what happens here is that there are spinning blades that force the air into constrictions. And what that does is increase its velocity and then reduce its specific volume. And of course, that's exactly what a compression really is. And that reduction in the specific volume increases the temperature and pressure. And so what ends up happening here is that the fluid is mostly forced up into this section of the turbine. So this whole body here is solid. And what happens then is that these are spinning. It draws the air up here, which then combines with the fuel injection and combustion sections. And so here is really where the flame is in the turbine. And then you have heat transfer from this combustion. And one of the really interesting things that happens up until now is, of course, the pressure goes up here, and so does the temperature. But as this combustion happens, it occurs in a chamber then that is right adjacent to this impeller. And so what happens is that the gas is allowed to be heated from the flame, but almost like it's in the open atmosphere. Now, of course, you don't have atmospheric pressure as you would here, but you have a combustion at this pressure here. So this happens essentially isobarically. And then after that heat transfer step, now the gas expands through the impeller section. And this of course is what generates power because the impellers spin and they spin a drive shaft. And whatever you want to move is actually connected on this end of the drive shaft. And then the hot gases that are still left after the combustion and expansion then go through the exhaust. Now, another view of this is shown here, where I actually think that this does a much better job of showing how the air is drawn into the combustors, but the operation is very, very similar, okay? So now that we kind of understand mechanically what is happening, let's do a little bit of the thermodynamics where we can ask questions about what, did, what does the action in each one of these individual steps mean for the PV and the TS diagrams that we've been talking about in recent lectures. And also the system that we just discussed seemed open, but how are we gonna talk about the air standard Brayton cycle, which is closed? Then finally, how do we find the efficiency of the cycle? So let's transition from here and start to do a little bit of the math. So if we convert our discussion in the PowerPoint presentation into something that we might call a step in a cycle, well, obviously step one in this Brayton cycle is then a compression. And in an ideal case, we have an adiabatic reversible compression with the idea that we wanna take the pressure from the initial pressure and go to some elevated pressure. And then I also said just a moment ago that this combustion happens at approximately constant pressure inside of the turbine. And so step two, sort of akin to a diesel cycle is an isobaric addition of heat. Right. 
And of course, that's like we just said, the combustion step or the step where heat enters the system. Then step three, of course, is then the expansion of the combustion products, which also can be assumed to be adiabatic and reversible. Now, if this combustion happens at the same pressure, the expansion, if you think about how a jet engine works, is that the exhaust is eventually going to go back to atmospheric pressure because you take in air and you release it. So what happens during this adiabatic reversible expansion, right, is that the pressure goes back to the original pressure. And so what we have is a cycle that operates with two isobaric steps. So if we draw this on a PV diagram, what we have is that we start here where we'll call this step A, and we have this reversible adiabatic compression. Now, one of the interesting things about a Brayton cycle is that the compression ratio isn't nearly as high as it is for an auto or a diesel cycle. So that goes to B, right? That's step one. And then at constant pressure, we're gonna add heat to the system, right? So the temperature should go up, which also means at constant pressure, then the specific volume has to go up. So here's step two. Right, and we'll call that state C. And then step three is our reversible adiabatic expansion, right? And this is where we do work, okay? So those are the three steps that we have discussed. Now in an open system, it would seem like this is it, but instead of combustion, you can also have a closed working fluid gas like air. And of course, I already called that the standard air Brayton cycle. And so you can have step four, which at constant pressure, returns the air back to its original condition. And of course, that would require uh, isobaric removal of heat. Okay, and so those are our four steps. Now, how do we determine the efficiency of this Brayton cycle? Well, of course, we've defined efficiency for previous cycles as the network that you get from the system divided by the heat that's added. And so, of course, then this is minus the work from stage one plus the work in stage three, right? Because stage one is the compression and stage three is when we get work out of the system divided by Q2, right? Where step two is where we add the heat. Now we've used to our advantage multiple times this semester that for a cycle, right? Delta U is equal to zero, which is equals the sum of the heat steps plus the sum of the work steps. And from there, we can say that the efficiency is equal to then just minus the sum of the work, right? So the sum of the heat steps equals minus the sum of the work. And so this becomes then just Q2 plus Q4 divided by Q2. 
And so then our efficiency we get is just equal to one plus Q4 over Q2. Now, of course, Q4 and Q2 both happen isobarically. And so remember that when we have a constant pressure process, we already derived that Q is equal to delta H. And so that means that our efficiency for the Brayton cycle is just one plus the change in the enthalpy for step four divided by the change in the enthalpy of step two. Right? And that's equal to one plus then the integral from TD to TA. Let's see if I can maybe zoom out a little bit so you can see the diagram at the same time that we're doing this. of CP dt divided by the integral from TB to TC of CP dt. And so if the heat capacity is equal to a constant, then we get that the efficiency is equal to one plus CP times TA minus TD divided by CP times TC minus TB. And that heat capacity term will cancel. And so we're left with the efficiency of our Brayton cycle as being equal to one plus TA minus TD divided by TC minus TB. Now, of course we know that the temperature at D is always gonna be higher than A. And almost all of our other efficiency relationships have a minus sign, right? It becomes one minus. So it's very obvious that the efficiency is going to be less than one. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip those two and we end up with an efficiency for the Brayton cycle that is one minus TD minus TA divided by TC minus TB. And there is our efficiency. Now, although this is useful, most Brayton cycles are designed around the pressure. They're not designed around the temperature. And so that means it would be much more helpful to us if we could relate the efficiency to the pressure. Now, to do that, we know that the steps in one and three are reversible and adiabatic. So that means that steps one and three are isentropic. And maybe something that we could do is actually draw the TS diagram before we step forward and do this. So if we scroll back up to here, right? So we have our temperature entropy diagram. And so step one, before this reversible adiabatic compression, right, we're going to be at the lowest temperature and pressure. So we'll be at the lowest entropy value. So we'll be here approximately, right? That's going to be state A. And step one is reversible and adiabatic, right? So step two, where we go from B to C, yes, it's at constant pressure, but we know the temperature is going to go up. Therefore, the entropy has to increase. So we're going to go here, right? That's step two. And then we're going to have an adiabatic reversible expansion. So we're going to go down to here. And we know the entropy should be slightly higher than the initial condition because we're at a higher temperature and specific volume. And then finally, we can go back to the initial condition. Right, so there's our TS diagram. So the thing we're gonna be picking on here is these two steps in order to try and be able to describe what's happening in this cycle as a function of pressure, not just as a function of the temperature. And so for each one of these stages, of course, that means that delta S over R equals zero. And of course, we know that that's equal to the integral from T1 to T2 of CP over R 
dt over t minus the natural log of p2 over p1. And so we've done the math here multiple times. And we know that for air, that we can assume that it's a simple ideal gas. And when that's the case, the heat capacity, of course, is equal to seven halves R. So this becomes seven halves times the natural log of T2 over T1 equals the natural log of P2 over P1. And then, of course, that means that T2 over T1 to the seven halves equals P2 divided by P1. And we've done that math multiple times. And so therefore, in the context of the Brayton cycle, that means that the pressure at B over the initial pressure of A equals TB over TA to the seven halves and that PD over PC equals the temperature at D over the temperature at C raised to the seven halves. Now, if you remember about the Brayton cycle, the pressure at D is actually equal to the pressure at A and the pressure at C is equal to the pressure at B. So this is also just PA divided by PB. Now, I want to get these terms explicit with respect to the temperature instead of the pressure. Because remember that the efficiency equation above was explicit in the temperature. So if I do that, then I get that TA over TB is equal to PA over PB to the two sevenths, right? That's just this equation here. And then our second expression comes from over here. And of course, TD over TC is equal to PA over PB to the two sevenths, okay? And so now let's evaluate the term that was on the right side of our efficiency equation, which was one minus TD minus TA divided by TC minus TB. And so if we look at this in the context of what we've done here, that we can actually solve these expressions above for TA and TD. So of course, TA equals TB times PA over PB to the two sevenths and TD equals TC times PA over PB to the two sevenths. And if we insert that into our equation here, well, that means that TD minus TA becomes TC times PA over PB to the two sevenths minus TB times PA over PB to the two sevenths, then divided by TC minus TB. And so then our efficiency is one minus, and if you look, we have a common factor here in the numerator. And that common factor, of course, is PA over PB to the two sevenths times TC minus TB divided by TC minus TB. And what that gets us is an efficiency based on pressure for the Brayton cycle that's equal to one minus PA over PB to the two sevenths.